Hello, my name is Sonia Deep, and we are going to be talking about block range indexes or BRIN indexes, which is a new feature for Greenplum 7. We are going to go over an overview of how BRIN indexes work. Um, we'll talk about the primary use cases, um, what the index granularity looks like, and how you can tune it, um, how you maintain BRIN indexes, um, the specific administrative tasks that you need to do to maintain them, um, the data types that BRIN is supported on, um, and then we'll do a comparative study with BRIN B3 and BRIN indexes. Um, we'll look at some performance numbers, and finally, um, we can also talk about partitioning versus BRIN, uh, which are two similar approaches uh, for data skipping. So let's talk about the history of BRIN indexes for a second. Um, it, this isn't a new thing. Um, in fact, this paper that dates back to 1998 uh, kind of came up with the idea. Um, it's not known as BRIN specifically. It's not called BRIN in the literature, um, but it is synonymous to a variety of things such as exadata storage indexes, Netiza zone maps, snowflake pruning metadata, and vertical position indexes. Um, in some, in many cases, it's not maintained as an, the uh, summary information is not maintained as a separate index uh, separately, but it might sometimes be tied with the physical file. Um, but the idea is the same. We store a bit of uh, summary metadata for each block or range of blocks. I use that uh, in during query execution. Um, for Postgres, Brin was introduced in 9.5 by Alvaro Herrera. So with that history, um, let's talk about what, what it is and what, what it does. So as I mentioned before, Brin is a data skipping technique. So you want to filter out large portions of your base table um, in your query. And Brin is a way to do that, right? The way to do that um, the what it does essentially is it summarizes ranges of continuous contiguous table blocks and it keeps the summary information around. It's a very compact uh, summary because you can imagine we are not storing part tuple information like other indexes such as B-tree would. We are instead storing, let's say, blocks one to hundred. What is the minimum value and maximum value? We'll see that shortly. And what this does is with this kind of deduplication or summarization of the data, um, the BRIN indexes end up being extremely compact and have very minimal update overhead or insert overhead. Um, this, at the same time, we aim to approximate B tree performance. So you're getting the advantages of B tree, the speed ups, without the problems that B trees have um, in OLAP environments. So, how does it work, right? Um, as I mentioned, BRIN is a data skipping technique. So let's say you have a simple query with a range filter on foo, and let's say you have a BRIN index on the column i, right? So this is what the index rel file would look like. It stores that for the table relation file, um, for blocks 64 through 95, um, the minimum value is 10 and the maximum value is 20 for the column i. Similarly, 30 to 35 for this range of blocks and 50 to 60. Now, if you look at the filter criteria, um, we want we want to communicate that only scan 64 through 95 and 512 through 543. We do not want to scan any of the other blocks. You can kind of notice that there is a um, physical correlation here. The, uh, the numbers are increasing, 10, 20, 30, 35, 50, 60. So the values of I are kind of increasing. So that's important. I'll come come to that. But you can see clearly from uh, from this diagram here that we do not want to scan the other blocks. We just want to scan 64 through 95 and 512 through 543 as they match the criteria. Um, the brain index can do that. The brain index can actually look at the predicate. It can look at the minimum maximum values which are stored for each of these bl block ranges. And then it can figure out that, okay, I only need to scan 10, to, I need to scan 64 through 95 and 512 through 543. And we can effectively skip all the other blocks that don't match with the filter. So it communicates that up the, stack, up the execution stack by just emitting a lossy block bitmap. And the, the, this bitmap just, says, just contains the 
numbers effectively it contains the numbers of blocks that need to be scanned right so effectively we then use the bitmap to go and return just these blocks right we scan just these blocks and return them now note that the act of returning a block unlike an in regular index scan it does not guarantee that all the tuples in that block will satisfy the criteria as you can see we have i greater than 15 here um, and the minimum value for this block is 10. So there will be a large number of rules in this block that don't apply to the, to the filter, that, that don't pass the filter. So they need to be quote unquote rechecked. Um, and so this highlights that Brin is a data skipping technique. The, the ranges that are actually returned by Brin, it doesn't mean that for 100% all of the tuples of, of the, those ranges are going to match your selection criteria. They can match, right? And any of the blocks that lie outside the set of return blocks, stuff that's in blue here, those are 100%. There's no way that any of those tuples in those cases would match the criteria. So we effectively skip all, the, all these blocks, and then we return a very small subset out of which some rows may be applicable to the filter. So that's that's how it works. So this is the kind of in, uh, syntax. It's very simple. Um, unlike B tree indexes, where you could just get away with not using uh, the using keyword, you could just say on orders order date. You just have to say using Brin because it's a non-default. And uh, once you do that, you can create the index. It's very simple syntax. Now, what's the primary use case look like, right? Um, you typically use Brin indexes for things with uh, that are highly correlated. As you as you saw that there was the values of i increased with the block numbers here. Uh, lower lower numbered blocks had tend to like lower values of i. Higher numbered blocks had higher values of i, and so on. Um, so typically you have this highly correlated um, columns. If you have highly correlated columns, you can have stock market data, IoT sensor data, time series data. Those are examples. Right, and you have range filters on them, and you have the strong correlation. That is where brain indexes are fantastic. Right, um, you can actually go and check what the correlation is if you analyze the table already. Um, you can go and look at PG stats, and you can look at the correlation, and you can filter on the table name and the attribute name, and you can get, for example, here the orders table uh, in from TPCH. We created the orders index and what we did was when we loaded the data, we sorted the order data by order date. So that's why we have a very strong correlation of one. This is the ideal case. But imagine this, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, I'll, I'll come, to, come to that in a second. Um, what would happen, let's say, if you didn't have ideally correlated columns? Let's, let's look at that first. Um, let's say you had zero correlation. That means that let's say um, the values of i in this table are from live between one to 100, and there is no correlation, zero correlation. So the tuples can be anywhere and everywhere. So what you would have end up with is that minimum and maximum values would start to look the same almost for a large fraction of the blocks. And ultimately, you might be just asking to scan the entire table file. Um, which is just as bad as a sequential scan and only worse because you have all this bitmap and processing overhead from uh, from reading the relation file, index file, and, and so on, right? All these extra steps. But this is clearly the very bad case. And that's why you need high correlation, right? Um, if you had high correlation, then the picture would have looked like this. Uh, whereas if you don't, it will look like this, right? You'd be scanning everything under the sun or, or a large section of your table. You don't want that. Um, fortunately, if you have low correlation on your uh, on your uh, column, a print index might not be picked, right? Um, so there is a safeguard in place. But correlation is a very important thing to keep in mind. Now, you don't have to have exactly perfect sort order for the for the data. Um, imagine that between ten between uh, in for the block 64 through 95, the minimum is 10 and the maximum is 20. Maybe you parallelly loaded the data and some tuples are just out of order, in, in, but still the minimum and maximum holds, 
that's fine. Correlation for such kind of data will not be equal to one. It might be equal to 0 0.6, 0 0.7, whatever, right? There, it, it might be, um, there will be some high amount of correlation, but it doesn't have to be exactly perfect, um, is what I'm trying to say. Parallel data loads would, um, if, for example, you have orders, order data, um, orders from the last hour just came in, you loaded it parallelly, the rows are not in order. But again, for a window, for a set of data blocks, it's they're all clustered around the same kind of value, which is that R in which you loaded the data. So in that sense, it's completely fine. And we should use a Brin index. Again, um, this is TVCH query for, you um, put a Brin index on the order date column for the orders table. Um, let's see what that actually looks like, right? Um, in terms of execution plan, right? So as I mentioned, there is a bitmap index scan, which produces the bitmap, and there's a bitmap heap scan. Um, if there were no Brin index, this would have just been a sequential scan. This, these two would have been just replaced by a sequential scan. But now you have a bitmap heap scan and, and bitmap index scan. So the index scan would tell you what blocks to scan and the bitmap heap scan would go and scan those blocks and apply the recheck condition to ensure that the, um, all the tuples in those selected blocks actually meet the criteria. And then it'll bubble up the result set. So that's kind of what you would see. So, so whenever you have a Brin index and you want to know if you've got picked or not, look for these. Um, let's take a look at the index. Um, if you backslash D plus the name of the index, you get you get this kind of information, right? Uh, one of the pieces of information is the index granularity, which is also called the pages per range. You can actually tweak this. When you create the index, you can tweak the value. Um, so we'll get to that and how you should pick it and so on, but just something to keep in mind here. And for the index, uh, let's say, uh, that we created before, right? Um, what does what would it look like? If you have the page inspect extension, you can install it and you'll see something like this. Um, it, this basically says block number zero through 31. The minimum value is 1st of January, 1992. Maximum value is 2nd January, 1992 and so on. And then the next set of values start from 32 to 63, 64 and onwards, right? So that's that's how information is kept. You can actually kind of look at it, which is kind of neat with page inspect. All right, so how do you control index granularity? You just append the width clause and you specify the pages per range. What is the default pages per range though? Um, well, for Postgres it's 128, but for Greenplum it's 32 because uh, Greenplum has four times the block size as Postgres. So we just scale that down. And ultimately for both Postgres and Greenplum, we cover one megabyte of base table, heap, heap table data um, with, uh, with the default, right? One Brin summary tuple covers one megabyte of base table data, right? Now for append optimized tables, which is a specific different uh, table access method for Greenplum, um, we actually default it to one and we'll, make that very clear why um, very shortly. So how do you choose a page, uh, pages per range? How do you choose it? Well, it depends on a few things. Um, what is your tuple density? That is the number of tuples in a block. What is your range density? That is the number of tuples that are covered by a Brin range, which is essentially just the tuple density multiplied by the pages per range, right? And what is your predicate selectivity? How much of the tables rows are you selecting? Right, these three, these three things come into play among other things, but this is a good starting point. So how do you know what your tuple density and range density are, right? If you have a heap table, let's say you have Brin index on it and your pages per range is 32, right? Um, the way to obtain the tuple density is just divide rel tuples and rel pages and you'll get it. So in this case, line item, uh, has around 209 tuples with the default fill factor for heap tables. And the range density is just multiply the tuple density by 32 and you get the range density. Now this is like 6,700 tuples per range. So one piece of summary info min max information actually corresponds to 6,708 tuples. Now let's contrast this with an EO table with the brain index with pages per range 32. 
you will notice that we have just, it's not a function of rel tuples or rel pages. It's constant 32K value as we've not, uh, we've uh, like added that as tuple density. The reason why it is so is because EO tables have this concept of var blocks, variable size blocks. So heap tables have fixed size blocks. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, heap tables have fixed size blocks of 32K. AO tables do not. They have variable size blocks. So to make Brin work with AO tables, we have this concept of logical heap blocks or logical blocks. So a logical block, AO block, contains 32K tuples. And that's what we use. So when you specify pages per range, you're working on blocks of 32K tuples in AO, which is very different from heap, slightly different from heap, right? So you have to keep in mind that AO tables have a very high tuple density. And if you use the pages per range of 32, you'll see what the range density is. Look at the granularity. It's just much more coarse grain now. Um, this is also why um, the default pages per range for AO tables are scaled down to the value one, which means one range for a brain index will cover 32K tuples. You can't go lower than that, unfortunately. So that that's a very uh, important thing to keep in mind. Uh, when choosing pages per range, what kind of table you're choosing it on. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be choosing uh, pages per range equals uh, 32 for your tables. All For all you know, uh, your uh, filter is like that. It 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 is it can tolerate coarse screened information. That's all good. You can bump the range. And we'll see later on bumping the pages per range can have interesting or good effects. Um, so when you're choosing pages per range, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is um, the number of discarded rows or the number of rows removed by recheck, which you will see in the bitmap heap scan. If you have too many rows, which are just like, if you have, if you essentially, like if you go back to this um, example right here, right? Uh, if you were to choose just double, uh, let's say we, ch we chose a block, uh, a pages per range of 64 instead of 32, now these min maxes would just meld together. So the, you would have minimum of 10, maximum of 35, right? And if you supply this, now you are scanning more than you needed to scan if you had a lower pages per range value, right? Not only are you scanning more from disk, you're paying IO cost for that, but also importantly, you're, um, you're paying a lot of CPU because now you have, you're basically checking that filter condition, this, this filter condition on each of those extra rows that you didn't need to check, right? So that's one of the things when you have, to, you have to keep in mind, what is the selectivity of your filter and how many tuples in the, if this was an AO table, this would have been like the number of tuples in this range would have been very high, right? So those are the kind of things that you have to keep in mind. And especially if you have number of tuples selected from your query much lower than your range density, you are going to be heavily on discarded rows. The discarded rows will start to become a pain for you, right? It will become an even, even worse, especially if your bitmap index and heap scan combination is on the right-hand side of a nested loop join and you're doing, and you have a high end loops value. That means you just, this like scanning over and over again, and you're discarding over and over and over again. So that's also something to keep in mind. So let's take an example of a comparison between pages per range. So let's start with pages per range is 32 on a heap table, right? And you have an extremely selective filter. So I'm looking at a worst case here. So in the worst case, um, the, for pages per range of 32, you see that rows removed by index recheck is around 21K over here and execution time of 87 milliseconds, right? Now, what if you bump this to 1024 pages per range? Immediately, the rows removed by index recheck goes up dramatically and the execution time becomes like three times in this case. So this is a, this, this is an example, right? Um, let's take a EO table, right? Pages per range one. And you can see rows removed by index recheck is around 373 
1,000. Uh, um, one thing to keep in mind that I would like to say here, when reading a plan for green plum, um, this, looking at this, or looking at the number of rows here that are output from the uh, node, this is not for the entire cluster. This is only for the heaviest segment that you have, right? That's that's the way it's presented. So for the heaviest segment, we have 73K rows removed. So what, what happens with that is that you have like an execution time of 103 milliseconds and you have 73K rows removed. If you bump the pages per range from one to 32, you have dramatically way more rows removed, obviously, as predicted. And you have an execution time that is 12 times worse, right? So this is just, these are just toy examples, but if you scale them up, these will apply. Um, but the filter selectivity is very important here. We are selecting such, that, like we are selecting a number of rows that is lesser than the range density, much lesser than the range density, which is why you're paying this kind of price. Now, how do you, how you choose pages per range also depends on other factors. Now, what if your um, filter predicate is uh, not that selective, right? It, what if the number of rows you're returning is consistently greater than the range density and you're selecting multiple ranges out, right? Um, then it, it might mean that you can increase the pages per range a little bit. So what if you increase it so that it matches platform read ahead, right? Um, the idea here is that if you're reading, say, four pages, you want to read four pages, your IO request is four pages, but your read ahead is always gonna read eight pages, right? You're, you're not saving anything. You would, when, when, you, when you read four pages, you're actually reading eight pages. So might as well just align the two. That's, that's kind of the school of thought. Now, if you do this in an and where your predicate isn't that uh, isn't that selective and it matches, great. And what would happen in, is that if you have high latency storage like cloud storage, or you have slower devices, uh, you would win, um, and you would uh, you would save significantly on the I/O cost. Sometimes that's more important than um, than saving on CPU. Um, in certain certain cases, certain workloads. So that's something to keep in mind. Again, adhering to Greenplum recommended value of 16384 for read ahead, that would kind of like map to a 256 pages per range for heap tables. All right. Um, let's talk about how you maintain brain, brain indexes now. So um, unlike B3 indexes, brain indexes need dedicated maintenance steps. They need to be summarized explicitly by the user and they are not always updated on inserts. We'll make that very clear with a couple of examples. But just, just so you know that brain indexes save on the update and insert overhead that you see with B3 indexes simply by not even caring about the updates or the inserts that come their way for the most part. That is why you need uh, explicit Brin summarize new values call uh, to summarize the newly added ranges. And it, it takes a share update exclusive lock. It's not a very restrictive lock when you do this. So let's, let's step into this and, and see what this kind of looks like. Right. So say you have an AO or heap table with 200 full blocks, right? There's no more space left in any of these 200 blocks, let's say. You create the Brin index for the first time using create index, right? What happens is all of your blocks will be summarized. Now, if you have like a read-only table, which was just bulk loaded once and you don't, you don't need to worry about anything, you can just stop right here, right? But if you have, if you have, data that keeps coming in, like you just append to the table with new new writes or new bulk loads with your ETL, let's say. Let's say you added 100 new blocks, right? For those newly added 100 blocks, none of those 
blocks will have any summary information in the index. It will not be updated. Now, what happens if a query comes in? If a query will come in, uh, the index is going to just say that, hey, I don't know about blocks 200 to 300. I have no info on them. Might as well conservatively scan them. So it, in the output bitmap, we are going to say scan blocks 200 to 300, irrespective of what filter you have provided. So that is why it's very important to keep the index updated um, to schedule the summarization procedure. Um, and in this case, if you run brain summarize new values to do that, it will return the number of blocks, which is, which is 100 in this case, right? One important thing to highlight here is that when you do when the when the summarization happens, it's a partial scan of the table. That means to perform the summarization and to create the min-max values, the you don't need to scan blocks that are already summarized, which is one to two hundred. You don't need to scan them. Only two hundred to three hundred need to be scanned. So this isn't that expensive if you think about it. Um, now. Let's talk about what happens with updates and deletes on heap tables, right? Uh, consider you have the same heap table with 200 blocks, but only this time, let's say these blocks aren't full and they have actually free space. Maybe there, there were some deletes and they were vacuumed, right, recently, and you have a lot of free space on them. Are you using a low fill factor? Um, there is space on these blocks. Now, let's say you did some updates. Then let's say you create the index. You do some updates after that, right, on these blocks. Let's say all of the new tuples from the updates map to the existing 200 blocks. If this is the case, then the summary information for the 200 blocks will be updated. This is the property of the brain index, that if a block sees writes, um, the summary will always be updated, if the summary existed. If the summary didn't exist and it was a new block, then nothing would be updated and you would have to run print summarize new values. Um, so it depends, right? Depends on your workload, depends on your application. Typically, probably you'll have updates that will map to both existing blocks and new blocks. So you would have to run summarize new values. So rule of thumb is to run summarize new values regardless, right? Um, vacuum is interesting because vacuum effectively at the end of vacuum during index maintenance, it's going to effectively run summarize new values. So if you're running vacuum, you don't need to run print summarize new values separately, right? And when I'm talking about vacuum, I'm, I'm not talking about vacuum full, I'm talking about lazy vacuum or regular vacuum. Um, one interesting thing to note with this is since it calls print summarize new values, it is not going to summarize or resummarize the existing ranges. So what happens, for example, let's say if you go back all the way here um, to this slide, right? Let's say we delete so many tuples that the main changes from uh, 10 to 18, right? Or, or the max changes to, let's say, 14, right? We deleted that many tuples. Now, if if the query comes in, we would still have the old min and max information. It's not updated. Vacuum is not going to update this, right? So we would be conservatively saying that, okay, go and scan this, but you don't need to scan it, right? So how how do you how do you uh, like ensure that this is updated? Well, the only way to do that is to re-index the table. Unfortunately. Um, so you can see kind of that um, that is that may be a problem because reindex can take time, right? And uh, but it, again, it, it it depends, right? Uh, if you have a heavy update and delete workload, brain indexes might not be for you, but might be for you as well if you can shoehorn the reindex steps somewhere into your workflow, right? Um, or if you're running vacuum full on the table. Which internally does a reindex. So um, let's talk about append optimized tables and vacuum because that's an interesting area, and we have applied a specific optimization here. 
So in append optimized tables, what happens is um, all the dead tuples, all the sorry, all the live tuples uh, in an existing sec file. Let's say these are the blocks which have both deleted and um, live tuples, right? Like and and you run vacuum on it. What happens is tuples from these this block range is going to be moved to a new sec file. Only the live tuples will be moved. The dead tuples will just be left there. Right, so there's a property here for EO tables that we can exploit. The idea is that um, vacuumed ranges will never see writes again. That means the logical block number three three five five four four three two all the way through six three one will never again see writes, even after the vacuum is finished and you reuse that sec file. All new writes will start from three three five five four four six three two actually not just after this one. So the existing range is never going to see any new writes. So what we can do is when we run vacuum, we can mark these ranges as empty. And we essentially, and we communicate to the execution, execution machinery is that these ranges are empty, don't scan this range ever. You're never going to find anything here, don't scan it, there's nothing here. So there will never be any discarded rows that will be created from scanning these ranges. If we didn't apply this optimization, it would have had pretty large implications just because of the scale of AO tables. And the fact that we never reuse them, right? Heap tables, these blocks will be reused because the free space will be created and free space of existing blocks will be exploited, but not for um, append optimized tables. Something to keep in mind. Um, what do workflows look like, right? You can create the table, you can do your ETL, then you can create the index to just kind of save on the first ETL loop. Um, again, th that's the only difference between workflow one and two. Um, and then you just keep summarizing or vacuuming, whichever, depending on the type of workload you have. You have no, no deletes and updates, no need to run vacuum. You can just run summarize, that'll be easier. But if you have updates and deletes and you're running vacuum anyway, uh, you can chuck, su summarize out the window. You don't need that. Vacuum will take care of it for you. If you're on vacuum full, then that's that will do, do the re-index anyway. Um, this, when I say vac here, I mean regular vacuum, right? Um, so the, the only difference between workflow one and workflow two is that you're just saving on the initial update or insert overhead from the uh, from the this ETL here, right here. By doing the ETL later you are paying a little bit, the first ETL that you're doing here, you're paying a little bit uh, because the index is present. Now you would have to pay a huge amount if it was a B3 index, where you have to pay next to almost nothing for a Brin index. Um, but if you have an existing workflow with a B3 index, you can just use uh, the same kind of workflow for a Brin index. Um, now, if you have non-correlated data, um, you, have, you have your dates all over the place in the orders table, right? And it, your new ETL is destroying, or the, let's say you add 300 new blocks to your 200 ta block table, and those 300 new blocks have no uh, sorting whatsoever. So you have to repack the table um, to ensure that your, in, your indexes are useful, right? This can be pretty expensive. Um, for AO tables, we're in Greenplum 7, we have the operation called alter table repack. And you can specify the table that you, the column that you want to repack the table by. So if you want to repack by order date, it's going to sort the data by order date, and it's going to populate a fresh relation file for you. And it will also internally re-index the any indexes present, which is a big winner, right? If you do not have an AO table, you can't run alter table repack at the moment. Then you'd have to resort to CTAS with sorting. Unfortunately, brain indexes do not support cluster. Um, that is kind of unfortunate. If you have a B tree index and you kind of relying on correlated data and range filters, then you could have substituted the C task with sorting with cluster. But with brain indexes, unfortunately, we don't have cluster. But anyway, so you have to kind of rewrite the table here to ensure that uh, you have the sort order preserved. Now, what are the kind of indexable data types? What can you put the brain index on, right? So obviously things that are 
that makes sense right away are dates and timestamps, integers, numerics, text, box uh, is an interesting one. And there's also um, time sorted UUIDs. Um, so if you have UUIDs uh, that are generated with respect to a matter of timestamp and they have some natural order, then that's a good idea to put a brain index on them. Um, to get a complete list, you can just click on this link. Um, now let's talk about B-tree indexes versus Brin indexes, right? Um, as I mentioned before, B-tree indexes support cluster, Brin doesn't. Um, B-tree is specifically meant for point queries, but they, it also does pretty good job with range filters and uh, correlated data. Whereas Brin index is not going to do well with point queries, where you're just returning a couple of rows. It will lead to a lot of wasted lookups. We've already seen kind, that kind of. Um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, B tree indexes are automatically maintained. If you insert data, it's going to be automatically updated in the index. New index tuples are going to be formed, et cetera. Right? Brin, on the other hand, as you've seen, needs a dedicated maintenance step. Um, Brin indexes support unique keys, right? So primary keys, unique keys, and their dependent optimizations are available for B tree indexes, not so for Brin indexes. Um, also, different kind of uh, plans uh, are possible with B-tree indexes. Like, for example, if you have, um, you want the top five orders by, or top five suppliers by subkey, right? Um, this kind of, this kind of uh, using the index to a kind of like to return a sorted result um, is possible with B-tree indexes, not possible with brain indexes as it has no notion of sort order. Um, again, B tree indexes store per tuple information, Brin indexes store per block or per range, block range information, right? And this is why B tree indexes have a very high disk footprint, whereas Brin indexes have very low disk footprint, dramatically low. And also because you're, you know, you have you have to record more information about about each insert, about each tuple that is inserted, and so on it has a lot of high insert overhead, uh, whereas print index has almost next to nothing as if the insert doesn't map to an existing block, existing summarized block, it, it's not gonna be even accounted for in the index. And you need to do, a, later on, you need to do a summarization, which is much more focused activity um, and which does a partial scan and it's very performant. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, Breach indexes have higher build time and wall volume. And brain indexes have higher, have lower build time and much lower wall volume, which we'll see very shortly. And obviously, uh, B tree indexes support different kinds of index based execution that brain indexes cannot support. One of those I just showed in the previous slide with the or order capability, but regular index scan and index only scan are possible with B tree indexes, but not possible with brain indexes. Something to keep in mind and also. Um, consider. So let's take a look of look at how B3 and Brin compare with respect to loading, data loading, bulk data loading. So here we've taken a toy example of TPC8 scale 30, which corresponds to a base table size for the line item table of 26 gigabytes. If you create a, Brin, a B3 index on it, uh, on let's say the ship date uh, of the line item table, it'll come to 3,562 megabytes, whereas the Brin size is just 1.3 megabytes. This kind of highlights a selling point. If you look at the wall volume that is created uh, as a result, it's just next to a one gigabyte and nothing almost for the Brin index. This is very significant because in a mirror cluster, uh, your throughput can be determined by your mirror, right? Um, because you wait for the replication to complete. Uh, we, and we have wall throttling and so on uh, for um, mirror clusters. So the, the wall volume can have an impact uh, as well as obviously the size. Um, so let's look at these two graphs now. Uh, what load performance is essentially, you already have the index created on the table and you're loading new, new rows into the table. So you can see, as compared to no index, B3 has significant overhead. Um, 
Whereas for Brin index, it's almost next to nothing. It's closely approximates the no index case. Um, in terms of build performance, B3 takes much longer time to build as compared to a Brin index. And that's very much due to the number of things that you have to account for. Brin, you just store the summary information. You're storing much less information. So yeah, you, you're getting a huge bump in build performance. And when you think build performance, it's not just create index, it's re-index also, right? If you run vacuum pull it also, or some other uh, operation that rewrites the table, that also comes into play. Um, and this is the B3 size with B3 fill factor is equal to 100. Um, you would get a little bit more uh, with the default fill factor of 90. The size would be a little more. Um, yeah. So once we're past the low performance, let's talk about the query performance, right? Um, the way we have set this up is that we are going to rely on the Postgres based planner in Greenplum as opposed to the other optimizer that we have, which is Orca. Uh, we are going to be varying the pages per range between one and 32, and we're going to be tuning work mem, which is a measure of the amount of memory that a particular ex operation operator, or in this case, in our case, really, it's a bitmap index scan and heap scan combination that can, um, that can, uh, that can take the amount of memory that each such node can take. Uh, we're gonna vary that. And we're going to just be using a local workstation and so just don't worry about the absolute values that you see on the charts. It's, we want to look at the relative differences in runtime, right? And it's a demo cluster with three segments, no mirrors, and uh, you know all the defaults in terms of Cox. We're going to do TPC at scale 30. We're going to do both heap and AO tables. Um, and we are going to create a few indexes here. So indexes will be all, all the primary keys of the tables. B3 indexes, we're gonna do some composite keys as well. And also, and the main thing is basically clustered, we are going to be clustering the tables by date. Like for example, orders by order date, uh, line item by ship date, and part table by, by the size and so on, right? And we're gonna create corresponding, these four BRIN indexes correspond to the four B3 indexes that we create. So let's talk about um, B3 scale 30 with heap tables, right? Um, you'll see that we have varied work mem here and we have, we are comparing against the no index case, right? And we have excluded queries here. So uh, TPCH is query one through 22. We have excluded queries where an in, in index was not picked, right? So for all of these cases, indexes have been picked. And you can see that we get gains somewhere like query six, we got a gain, query 14, we got a gain, 15, 20, we, got, we get nice gains. Um, so, but for many of the queries, we don't actually see a gain with the index being picked over the no, no index case, and that's completely natural. We might see a gain at higher scale. Um, the other thing to note um, is that in this particular slide, you don't get much from increasing the work map. More or less, it's the bars are the same throughout. Um, when you go to Brin indexes, uh, same experiment, scale 30 heap tables, but you're using Brin 1, which is Brin pages per range of one. Uh, you, you see that slightly the number of uh, queries have increased in which we pick the index. And you kind of see it's kind of the similar performance that we saw in the other case. Now, if you scale it up to Brin, and uh, now if you do uh, Brin 32 instead of Brin 1, it's more or less kind of the same results. Um, not much of a difference, really not much difference. Maybe there are a couple of queries in which uh, Brin was picked, uh, the index, the clustered index was picked. Now, if you look at uh, B3 scale 30 AO tables, you see a lot less queries incidentally being picked. Um, by the optimizer in which the clustered indexes, the, the four clustered indexes that we were talking about were picked, right? You see a lot less queries here. Um, in fact, um, we had to raise work mem quite a bit, let's say to one gigabyte uh, to get query 14 uh, to have the index picked. 
Uh, so here, B tree index was only picked with the clustered B tree index. The specific clustered B tree index was only picked at a higher work min. And you can see the kind of gain here that we can get out of that. It's pretty significant. Um, if you look at, if you go and create a brin of pages per range one, which is the default for AO tables uh, at the same scale, you'll see a lot, many more queries where the index, the clustered index has been picked, which is a good sign. And you can see the same kind of performance differences um, where the index has been picked. Not a lot between um, varying 128 and one gig, the yellow and the green bars are pretty much alike, but you can see uh, it was important to bump from the red, from 32 max to 128 max at least. To, and in many cases, we got the indexes selected because of that at higher work mem. So varying work mem is, in, uh, is, uh, is important. Um, if you compare BRIN1 and BRIN32 um, on the AO tables, in fact, BRIN32 is slightly better. I think 10% better overall if you compare the runtime of all of these things taken into consideration. Um, it's like 10% better than BRIN1. Um, that's due to a variety of reasons. Um, maybe you're getting better read head going um, or you know, uh, just that. Um, but apart from that, it's like mostly most of the same queries have the indexes picked, but not much of a difference there. Um, if you now do a, this slide just basically kind of bits B3 versus Brin for heap and uh, at 32 megabytes. And you can see that uh, um, for Brin indexes, only four, query four, query five, query eight, query 10, and query 19 had Brin picked. Query 14, where you see a difference between B3 and Brin, here the Brin index wasn't picked, unfortunately. Um, whereas the B-tree index was. Um, if you bump the work mem, however, if you look at query 14, now they're at parity because now the brain index has been picked, right? Uh, there are some other examples of this that you can, you can kind of contrast at your leisure and uh, look at it, right? Um, but in most cases, if you look at, just look at this one, um, most cases you will see that we met our goal, which is to approximate B tree performance. Sometimes Brin is a little bit worse in terms of performance than B tree. You can see that, but it's mostly comparable um, to B tree, which is exactly what we wanted. That was our goal. Um, this is another example, which is this is B tree versus Brin one scale thirty. This time it's on AO tables. Again, not much of a difference between B tree and Brin, um, and a lot more. Indexes were selected, obviously, at higher work mem, which is one gigabyte. And a lot more queries had the clustered indexes picked, obviously, you saw that. Um, query six and query 20 had, uh, had you know, in this, these are interesting, six and 20, uh, because in both cases, you see Brin beating B tree here. And the reason is that in this case, B tree wasn't picked, but the Brin was, the clustered index on Brin cluster Brin index was picked for six and 20, whereas not for uh, the B tree, um, which is interesting because the costing for B tree and Brin are slightly different and we pay more attention to plus the effect of clustering, right? Um, so to summarize the experiment results, right? In not every case did you see that indexes were actually giving you a performance bump. Maybe larger scale would have seen, you would have seen a, a bump. Sometimes indexes weren't even picked, right? Um, for the cases where it was picked, Brin approximated B3 performance. There was, there was not many um, performance differences when both of the indexes were picked. Um, sometimes Brin indexes were picked, sometimes B3 indexes were picked where Brin wasn't, whereas sometimes Brin was picked where B3 wasn't and so on. Um, we did see that higher values of work mem helped, especially to pick the indexes in the plans in the first place. Um, so especially for AOD. So that kind of gives you a summary of uh, what we've learned so far for, for the query performance experiments. Um, one other thing I want, uh, I want to highlight is that not always 
um, is like B3 and Brin index and indexes can really work together because they when both when you combine both of them, you can combine both of them. Like let's say you have this complicated filter on P size, which is a Brin index, and P container, uh, which is a B3 index. You can actually com combine them and create a bitmap or a bitmap and underneath the bitmap heap scan and you can have these bitmap scans on the on the on the different um, predicates right so uh, this is tpch query 19 uh, this is an excerpt from that so yeah you, you can actually combine them so on the same base table you can combine b3 and brin indexes together and get interesting results so finally we are at the last topic that we have, which is partitioning and Brin indexes. Now, both of these are data skipping techniques, right? Uh, partitioning has been heavily used for Greenplum for a long time, right? And the thing I want to mention is the primary difference between the two approaches for data skipping, where you're skipping large sections of your base table. With partitioning, you're also kind of doing data skipping because you're only going to select that one partition where, or two partitions or whatever number of partitions that uh, your predicate maps to and you skip out all the other ones. Same thing as Brin. The one difference with part, with um, static, uh, with partitioning is that it's static, right? The bounds are predetermined. You either partition by, let's say you partition by year, right? So you have a one partition for every year that you have in your data. Brin is more dynamic in that sense. The granularity is more dynamic. Um, so we'll we'll come we'll explore an example of why that matters. Um, one good thing about partitioning is that you that your data does not have to have strong correlation, whereas for Brin indexes you do, right? Otherwise the Brin index won't even be picked. So within the partition you don't need strong correlation. Um, there is overhead associated with uh, partitioning. Um, some of the it there the overhead racks up sometimes with uh, in inserts, updates, and deletes. There's some overhead with analyze because now you have to ma maintain root statistics on the partition groups. Um, there are other considerations also for partitioning, like you have to create new partitions, you have to attach them, you have to add new partitions. Um, otherwise you just end up with a fat lost partition, uh, especially if you're, um, you, have to, uh, you, have to do, you have to do more complex DDL to manage them and so on. But there are also other opportunities with partitioning that you won't get with Brin, like Brin indexes on a single fat table, right? Um, you have hybrid storage that is possible now in Greenplum 7. Um, you can have older partitions with higher compression, or you can change their access methods to make them like append optimized. You can have your your oldest 10 partitions, highly compressed EO tables, where your, your newer partitions can be heap tables or can have lower compression AO tables or something, right? Different set of optimizations and plan operators and executors, execute the executor operators are um, available for partitioning, whereas for Brin is just as you saw, bitmap index scan and bitmap heap scan. Um, finally, the other thing that I want to say here is that they are not opposing ideas necessarily. And there's a paper that I've linked here uh, that kind of uh, mentions that they can be combined. And obviously you can, for example, um, partition by year and then have Brin indexes on, month, on a month granularity or a day granularity inside. So it, it, it can be combined, but these are things that we can think about uh, when considering one over the other or considering how we can combine them. So let's just take an example, right? Um, of uh, data skipping with partitioning versus Brin. Uh, you have a line item table again, and you have done, you have partitioned by range ship date and you're partitioning at one year intervals. Similarly, you have a Brin index uh, on ship date with pages per range 32, right? So um, if you have a query, which basically wants to select one month's worth of data, whereas your static bound, partition bound is at the granularity of one year, you end up again, scanning too much, right? You have a lot of rows removed by filter, as you can see. Your execution time is three seconds, right? You can kind of see that you are only scanning this particular partition. Um, if you compare that plan or the uh, explain analyze output 
um, you see the lot less number of rows removed by index recheck and the execution time is much lower for brain index. Now, if you go, if you go even more selective, right? Now you have a day granularity in your predicate. The number of rows removed by filter is gonna increase. Your execution time will kind of always remain the same. Um, for the um, uh, for the partitioning case, right? And it will be even lower in execution time and the gap will be even wider for the brain index because the number of rows removed is even lower. Um, sorry, uh, the, not the rows removed. Yeah, the execution time is much lower. Um, yes, uh, the, actually the rows removed by uh, index recheck is also lower. So ultimately you end, you end up winning a little bit here. So it, there are these subtle differences and things to consider. Uh, you can just expand the scale and think about it. Um, so again, we've kind of come to the end of the presentation and um, future work in this area is going to be mainly co concentrated on a couple of things, mainly the second thing, which is the cost model tweaks um, so that we pick brain indexes more often, um, and especially prioritizing correlated data, for instance. And also we have a small patch upstream to optimize the data loading performance with print indexes uh, even further. There, it's almost next to no overhead, but we can go even further and make that even more performant. Um, with that, uh, this is a set of references. Uh, this is the Axel project presentation, uh, which I drew heavily off. Um, which introduced print indexes to Proscus. Um, this is the print documentation link for Greenplum, a mailing list discussion on pages per range, how you choose it, um, and then a Postgres mailing list discussion which introduced print, which is a very interesting read. So I encourage you to look into it and please reach out to us if you have any questions, comments, concerns regarding print indexes, if you see anything, any queries where BRIN is performing, good, let us know. If it's performing bad, let us know. And if you see it not being picked, let us know and things like that. So we'd appreciate the feedback. And I hope that you have a fun time using print indexes in your applications. Thank you very much.